Testament reading for the day of Pentecost is from Numbers chapter 11. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them, and Moses and the elders of Israel return to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each one of us, in his own native language? Parthians, and Medes, and Emelites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are all filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ears to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise from the reading of the gospel. <laughs> On the last day of the feast, the great day, 
Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this is he, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
is taken from our reading from Numbers, from the book of Acts, and from the Gospel according to St. John. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord. On my ninth or tenth birthday, my parents, uh, as they would always do, would give me birthday gifts. But that year, uh, they got me a four by eight sheet of plywood, about three quarters inch thick. They were smiling. They thought this was the greatest thing in the world. Now, if I got that, like, today, I know exactly what I would do with it. But back then, I'm going, did I ask for a four by eight sheet of plywood? I don't remember doing that. I would be pretty clear in whether or not I wanted a four by eight sheet of plywood. And so that perplexed me. But being a good son, I smiled and nodded and said thank you. And dad went off to work and mom went off to work. And that was that. And I just looked at that sheet of plywood all day going, well, what am I going to do with this? My parents have lost it. In our gospel reading, uh, you will notice, and it might seem rather obscure, in fact, if you would turn to page 5 and 6 in your bulletin, uh, the gospel reading, and uh, it's kind of a, because John doesn't really tell us what's going on here, so I'm going to kind of clue you in what's going on. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, you may be asking yourself, what feast? Um, this is the feast of tents, of booths, of tabernacles. It's a, a, a yearly um, a festival that they would do late September, early October to remember the wilderness wandering. And... Uh, and, and so this was their way of remembering how God provided for their 40 years of wilderness wandering with food and with water and how God watched over them and led them out of their bondage in Egypt to the promised land in the land of Canaan. And it's during this festival that the priest uh, would go down on the great day and he would take a golden pitcher or a bucket and he would go and make his way down to the pool of Siloam. Not that that's important for you, but it would go down and he would fill it up with water. And then he would make his way back into the temple. And so he would climb up all these stairs. He would go into uh, the place where the altar was. And while this is happening, trumpets were blowing and the choir was singing. And all this is going on so that people would recognize at this time. And what the, what the priest would do is take that water and he would pour it over the altar. Now there's two things that this symbolized. One was the water that God provided during their wilderness wandering. You remember that story? They were thirsty and God says to Moses, hit the rock and the water will come out of the rock and people will drink and they will be satisfied. And then the second reason was thanking God for the creation of water. They would go back and remember Genesis 1, verse 2, where it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water, as if God, the Holy Spirit, is blessing the water as he's hovering over that. And in the midst of this, Jesus cries out these wonderful words. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this is not the first time in John's gospel that Jesus makes reference to this living waters. A couple chapters earlier, you remember, Jesus is in the land of Samaria and he's talking to that woman at the well. Uh, as she's drawing water, and in the conversation, Jesus says, if you would know who is talking to you, you would ask him, and he would give you living waters. Well, she didn't know exactly what that meant. She goes, well, give me this living water so I never thirsty again. But Jesus wasn't talking about living water, just water water. But here we find out that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. I think John gives us a little editorial comment where he says, 
He's talking about the Holy Spirit, which has not come yet because Jesus was not glorified. And in John's Gospel, when he uses the word glorified, he's talking about the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His winning our forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so Jesus calls us out this remembering of how God provided in the world that is wandering, and how God uses water, and this pouring of the water, but Jesus equates it to the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit just didn't come on Pentecost Day. We read in our Old Testament lesson, Numbers chapter 11, how the Spirit was upon Moses. Moses had already been to Mount Sinai. He already received the commandments of the Lord. And we're told that he begins to teach the people the words of the Lord. And God says to Moses, bring forth the elders. So 70 elders were chosen and they gathered around the tent, the tabernacle. And it says the Lord took some of that spirit from Moses and he placed it upon the elders of the people. And they began to teach the words of the Lord. Now, there were two guys, Eldad and Medad, who didn't get the email about the meeting at the tent. <laughs> and they were still in the camp for whatever reason. But that didn't stop the Spirit to walk, come upon them, and they began to teach, to prophesy, to preach the words of the Lord. And there was a young man who was watching this happen, runs to Moses, and he goes to Joshua, and Joshua says, You need to tell them to shut down, quiet. And Moses says, are you jealous for me? Oh, how I wish, how I wish that all of you would receive the Spirit of the Lord. And then all of you would talk about the Lord and the words of the Lord. Going back to my birthday. My mom, um, pretty creative some days, she would leave little notes on my birthday, a little clues. And... Uh, first clue, well, I got this sheet of plywood, but the, the, the clue that I got for later that day is I was told to go into the garage and look on the workbench, and the next part of my birthday present was there. So I went into the garage, and what was there was a can of paint and a bunch of aluminum iron, angle iron with tubes and stuff, and I'm sitting there looking at that going, now I know my parents have really lost it because I didn't talk anything about paint or aluminum or anything like that. And I'm sure my mom and dad were just chuckling to themselves the whole day, probably thinking they think he's, they, he thinks we've lost our mind. And so I just went on and said, oh, okay, I have no idea what this means. Well, in our second reading today, in the book of Acts, the, the very thing that Moses wished for, that everyone would receive the Spirit and would begin to talk about the Lord, took place. And we know the story of Pentecost. The disciples are gathered together, and there's a, a, a wind blowing and tongues of fire, and they begin to speak in the known languages of the people that day. That whole list of people who were there were from the known Roman world at the time. And they were gathered there for Pentecost. That was a, another Old Testament celebration. The first, the biggest, is Passover. The, remembering, the yearly remembrance of how God brought them out of their slavery in Egypt and brought them to the Promised Land. The second was the, the, the uh, Festival of Two. Uh, booths or tabernacles where they would actually live in a tent for a week to remember how God provided for them. And the third one was Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And in the Old Testament, it was known as the Festival of Weeks where they would be reminded of how God provided for them. And on that day of Pentecost was a celebration and giving of thanks how God gave to the people his law. Also, in how God formed a new nation, how God formed a new kingdom, a new people, a new family, and how they gathered around and how God gave them the law and said, this is how you are to act, this is what you are to do, this is what you're not supposed to be doing, you are to act different than everybody else in the world, you are to be different because you are my people. 
So on this day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the people are there to celebrate that. But yet God has a different, different understanding of Pentecost now. Yes, people are gathering, but now he's establishing, creating a new family. It's the church. It's you and me. It's our celebration where we remember what God had done for us. How God came down as the Word. The Word made flesh so that we could be saved. That the Word made flesh, Jesus himself took him upon himself, your sins and my sins, and he suffered and he died for them there. So that the, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, we can now look at the cross of Jesus and go, now I get it. It's there that my salvation was won. It was there where my forgiveness was given to me. It was there where eternal life was granted to each and every one of us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It puts us in memory, remembrance of what Christ has done for you and for me. That's the job of the Holy Spirit to, to bring us to faith and to keep us in the faith. At the waters of holy baptism, oh, water, the Holy Spirit comes to us with the Father and the Son. And we are given the gift, the gift of faith, the gift of the Holy Spirit through the waters of holy baptism. And the Holy Spirit continues to come to us each and every day. Paul writes in the book of, of Ephesians, uh, he talks about, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but what he's talking about is be in the Spirit, or better yet, let the Spirit be in you. Now, what's very interesting about that sentence construction in the Greek, it is a perfect imperative passive verb to which you all reply, woo! Let me do it again. It is a perfect imperative passive. Ooh. Exactly. What that means for you and for me, perfect means it's happening all the time. Imperative, it's a command, and the passive voice means it happens from God. God is doing it. God, the Father, and the Son is sending you the Holy Spirit all the time through His Word, in baptism, in the Lord's Supper. This wonderful gift that comes to us each and every day of our life. I have to say the Holy Spirit is the gift that keeps on giving. It never stops. It never stops. Now, going back to my birthday, um, my parents finally came home and they decided to give to me the rest of my gift. Now, what I asked for and what I got at the time didn't make any sense. What I asked for that year was one of these. What my parents gave to me is not only one of these, but my dad made a backboard and put it on my garage in our backyard. And the last time I drove by that house, that backboard was still there. It's been there for almost 50 years. Spent many, many hours out there shooting the baskets, getting rebounds, doing all of that. What I asked was a simple gift, a basketball, but my parents gave to me so much, much more. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Many times we just ask for a simple gift, but he wants to give us so, so much more. And he does all the time. He gives us the gift of faith, that we can trust in what God has said and what he has done and will continue to do for you and for me every day of our life. That when God says to you, your sins are forgiven, the Holy Spirit helps us to believe and trust that and hold on to that every day of our life. When God says to you, you have the gift of eternal life, it's yours already. The Holy Spirit helps us to believe and trust in that. When God says, you already have salvation, you are my child, and nothing will ever change that. The Holy Spirit helps us to do that and to believe that and to trust that. Yes, the Holy Spirit wants to give us more and more and more and we know that it's through God's Word and the sacraments that He does that for you and for me. Every time you come up for the Lord's Supper, you receive the very gift of the forgiveness of your sins. But not only that, your faith is strengthened. 
that when you leave this place and you go out into that sinful world, you can trust and believe that God is with you and watching over you every step of the way. That when you remember your baptism, that God the Holy Spirit made you His very own. That the Father and the Son and the Spirit are with you every step of the way. That basketball. I don't have the basketball anymore. It's went away. But that backboard is still up there. Which is a constant reminder to me of my, my, my parents' love for me. As my dad made that for me. But as you walk to communion today, you walk by the baptismal font, be reminded of the gift that has been given to you. The gift of forgiveness, life, and salvation. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And when you come up and receive the very body and blood of Christ, know that your sins are forgiven. And you have eternal life and salvation. It's the Holy Spirit. The gift that keeps on giving. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise. <coughs> And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We make our confession of faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God. Light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us in the conscious God. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. And ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of